This question actually kind of pertains to the last two words in the council's name, urban habitat. I'm really appreciative of all of the technologies that I've seen today and that I continue to see as architecture moves forward. But do you have any good suggestions or any good ways that you guys approach kind of the more um, kind of down and dirty human aspect where you're talking about health and how people actually, you know, getting people to actually live more in these uh, skyscraper and super talls and even the mid-rise solutions where people would prefer to live closer to the ground and things. How do you, how do you address those kind of issues? Uh, we haven't had experience with uh, buildings higher than 22 um, stories, so we way out of the super tall league. But um, I think buildings should uh, seduce people into uh, loving them through the type of spaces they create, um, how these spaces feel, and that includes the environmental, uh, the, in the scientific sense, the environmental feeling of the space in terms of the air quality, the temperature and all of that. But just as important is how um, the spaces uh, appear and how they uh, in inspire a passion or um, a desire to live or occupy in them if they're office buildings or different sorts of buildings residential in the buildings that use them. So I think um, the architects and engineers and clients and the whole uh, integrated design team who are creating um, architecture for uh, the cities in, in this century should try to design places that are that in, inspire um, love in a way, or in, in, inspire people to to want to uh, live in them. And of course, we have to answer all the uh, very technical uh, questions, such as has been put forward by uh, Dr. Vada in, the, in, the, in in terms of seismic activity. Um, but I, I think one needs a combination of a highly scientific approach, but at the same time an intuitive artistic approach, so that the places that we're all creating together are um, yeah, inspiring and beautiful and uh, seductive and invite people to live and occupy them and then to behave in appropriate ways um, within them. Charles Porter with DMA. I represent uh, owner's interests on projects. And I have two questions for the KFW team. You showed an image of your double curtain wall, and there was a solid panel at the bottom of it. And I'd like to understand what the purpose of that panel was, other than to obstruct the view out of the window. I suspect there's some other reason. And also, from the owner's point of view, uh, if I could find out what the expected payback was for all of the investments in saving energy. Do you evaluate payback on a, a three-year payback, a four-year payback, as we would here in the States, or was that uh, an issue for you? Well, the uh, first question, simple to answer. Um, we were trying to minimize the um, amount of uh, glazed area in order to uh, improve the performance of the thermal performance of the first um, layer of the double skin. Um, and obviously, in terms of daylighting, this the sort of area below whatever 50, 60 uh, centimeters is not important, um, and um, and so therefore we made it solid. Second part, I hand over to Axel mm. Hintertan. <laughs> so this question is not very easy to answer because um, I think um, the return on investment is maybe 20 years or 30 years, so it's not. Uh, uh, yeah, suitable for any investor who has only uh, profit in his interest. Yeah. I can maybe add to that uh, from the experience from other projects. We have, uh, for example, done a, um, recently an office building in Cologne for a commercial developer um, who did see um, um, uh, commercial benefits um, less in the kind of in terms of the investment, but mostly in terms of running costs. We, we managed to lower the running costs by nearly 50 percent, which obviously then comes out in revenue. Um, so, I mean, I think the longer we experience, the longer we practice, the more experience we have in these uh, techniques, the more it becomes likely that they're also uh, economically um, uh, Interesting. Can I just add, add one thing to that? In terms of the economics, I think it's very interesting, the, the aspect of retrofitting, of course. And I think just as it works in terms of uh, structural retrofitting, one can retrofit buildings um, for, for sustainable um, criteria. 
And I think that's one, the, the big challenge in a way for the next 20 years is for architects and engineers all over the world to recognize the inherent value in existing structures and uh, try to reuse them rather than having an initial reaction to knock down and start again. So it's a, a kind of um, just general statement on linking the two retrofitting arguments. Great. Question, yes. Okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Akira Wander. And you just mentioned uh, the active uh, rule, uh, like the isolation, the uh, uh, path is a good new, a good way to avoid damage. Uh, but as we know, as the uh, height of the building rises in the weight as well as the shear force uh, raise dr dramatically. And it's hard to uh, prevent the uh, building to keep in its own place. And uh, how do you think the limit, I think, I mean the uh, what's the tallest limit for a isolated method to avoid earthquake damage? Thank you. Uh, when the very building was very tall and the width is very thin, the up uplift force will occur. So this is the criteria. Mm, but in Japan, already one force uh, one by four, we we made many uh, built many buildings on the seismic isolation, fifty-story apartment. But one hundred story, I I think uh, very difficult. It's okay. Fifty stories already, we done. Okay, let's let's take <laughs> one more question. Yes. Jacob Bruni from uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, and I have a question regarding the index. Uh, I was wondering, uh, the United, the UAE and uh, Dubai aren't really, uh, are known for a lot of fantastic things, um, uh, not usually for uh, energy conservation and sustainability, and as representatives of a project that make strides in that direction? Do you think that um, that's something that's changing? Uh, do you think that there's a lot of potential in that? Yeah, sure, well, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, I think I think the answer to your question is yes, it is changing. Um, I think the Middle East is, is recognizing um, that their economies, uh, their oil-based com um, economies can't go on forever. Um, and in actual fact, we've been involved in a, in a, a large um, project called Mazda, which is, which is primarily to address all those issues and, and demonstrate to the world that you can build cities of the future um, without relying on, on um, fossil fuels. Um, and, and that project's underway and that some of the buildings already been built. So yes, they are thinking about the future and yes, they are trying to move in that direction. One of the things that has to follow really is is legislation. Um, governments have to um, you know make make people do certain things because otherwise developers and owners won't necessarily um, go in that direction. But I think certainly in the countries we've worked in in the Middle East, um, governments are certainly starting to to take that very seriously and um, and introduce legislation to to make that happen. Just uh, briefly following on Toby's comments, I, I agree. <clears throat> and uh, interesting thing happened right before the crash. Uh, the um, Sheikh Mohammed passed a, a decree where every building in Dubai had to be LEED certified. So it was it was a bold step. I think it was um, unfortunate in terms of timing. As Toby said, there's no uh, legislation behind that, but I think it shows that they are forward thinking. And uh, I'm sure the legislation will follow. Speakers, congratulations on your awards and on your career. And let's all give them a round of applause for great speeches. Thank you.